Okay, I want to be respectful of everyone's time, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. I want to thank you for joining us. This is a pre-recorded session. Uh, that just means if you have any questions or if you want more information about the program, please place them in the Q&A feature in the bottom of your toolbar. Uh, we will get those questions to the appropriate person and make sure you get a response within one business day. With that, let's go ahead and get started. If you have any questions for me, please place them in the Q&A or the chat and I will be sure to monitor. Good morning, my name is James Collins, Senior Director of Business Development here at CSBA. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar as we focus on Life Wings Peak Performance, Save for Air, Defeating Invisible Enemies, Saving Money and Saving Lives for CSBA School Districts. At this time, I would like to introduce our partner, Life Wings Peak Performance, presenters for today's discussion. Richard, Richard Doss, Senior Vice President, Dr. Scott Altman, Senior Medical Liaison, Roger Silvera, Director of Maintenance and Operations at the Eastside Union High School, High School District. At this time, I will turn it over to our first presenter, Richard Doss. Thank you, James. Uh, I just wanted to say at the outset, we value our, our relationship and partnership with the California School Board Association. There's people doing some tremendous work. Uh, we've traveled uh, 40 out of 52 counties over the last year working with CSBA, and uh, obviously we're coming out of a pandemic, and that's one of the reasons we wanted to get together today. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about uh, some changes now as we go from a pandemic to an endemic phase. Dr. Altman will um, uh, give us uh, a bit of an overview, and then I, I want to share, we're going to share, I should say, some uh, some findings and, and what have we been finding out with the assessments we've done to date, and what are we finding out uh, in the field at different school districts, different sizes of school districts and school sites. Uh, Dr. Altman will talk about uh, mitigation and, and going forward and how um, some of the ways we think about safer air and the way we think about um, the breathing zone in our buildings. We'll have an exciting case study from Roger uh, at Eastside Union High School in his work uh, over the last 10 years. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the AB 841 grants and the funding uh, opportunities for schools and what have we been learning over the last 10 months regarding the grants and applications and getting uh, funding for schools so they can um, make some changes and not be worried about their general fund. Uh, Dr. Altman will get us started. Thank you, uh, James and Richard, and to the uh, California School Board Association. Um, this is a new virus. Uh, it's presented many surprises, not the least of which has been its, been its ability to mutate. It's proven rather unpredictable, too frequently catching us off guard, and it looks like it may well be coming back again to haunt us yet another time. Uh, although we are still learning a lot about this virus, there's a lot that is known. The most important lesson has been the droplet aerosol spread. There's a fascinating backstory on how and why we were initially taken down the droplet path, washing, wiping, and social distancing, and why it's been so difficult to pivot to aerosol with its focus on air hygiene rather than hygiene theater. But regardless, we clearly understand the importance of cleaning our water, our food, even our sewage, and finally, we've been brought to paying attention to our indoor air. Historically, indoor air has, was simply heated with hot water boilers and radiators. Buildings were leaky. Inside, we had overdoor transoms to allow air movement. And outdoor air was relatively unpolluted and safe to allow inside. As we've become more industrially advanced, we developed air handling systems with a focus on cost, efficiency, and temperature control. We installed MERV-8 filters as much to protect the equipment as to filter out the dust of our indoor air. MERV-8, of course, is not strong enough to filter much more than dust. I won't bore you with too much science, but if you think about human temperature control on a hot summer day, evaporating sweat cools the body. Similarly, as we exhale, our breath contains air, tiny moist droplets, and even tinier particles called aerosols. Wet droplets are heavy and quickly fall, and that's the blue dots in Dr. Lindsay Marr's graphic in the bottom left of this slide. The lighter aerosols float in the air like cigarette smoke, which is the red floating dots in the picture. What we missed initially is that we exhale droplets at body temperature. As they cool to room temperature, 
the moisture, saliva, mucus surrounding them evaporates, leaving aerosol-sized particles to float rather than drop. Masking works because the relatively large droplets coming out of our noses and mouths are big and wet and therefore relatively easy to trap. Once they become aerosolized, we need to tighten up and use an N95 mask. A surgical mask is good, but not great for aerosol. In the end, the message of the day is that you don't want to inhale what I exhale until that air has been cleaned. In fact, you don't want to inhale smog, pollen, forest fire, smoke, or volatile organic chemicals either. So our safer air message today is to contaminant neutral. We aren't anti-COVID any more than we're anti any potential toxin. We want to help move from designing buildings with minimum standards to healthy standards and move from acceptable indoor air quality to healthy indoor air quality. The bottom right graphs are from a monitor that I have outside my daughter's bedroom in my basement. Imagine having that in the window to our restaurant so you could see not just the menu, but the air quality as you choose which one to enter. Imagine the comfort real-time quality graphs would offer to your board, teachers, staff, and students. Next slide, Richard. So all that washing, wiping, and distancing, well, it still remains important, but for other contaminants than COVID. As we move from pandemic to endemic, we're backing off of our short-term mitigations. If you look at the CDC's new hierarchy of controls, physically removing the hazard is step one, the most effective way to improve the air we breathe. Vaccines are great, but it's important to remember their goal is to prevent serious illness, hospitalization, and death. Like the annual flu shot, they do not prevent infection. They make infection less serious. As a result, the goal of our presentation is to help schools make their buildings healthy. You don't want to inhale what I exhale until it's been cleaned. I'll be back later to talk about what we can do to make our indoor space healthier. But first, Richard's going to talk about what we found inspecting schools in California. Richard? Thank you, Dr. Altman. Appreciate the... Uh... Uh, introduction on this, and, and as we have been performing assessments at different uh, school districts and different environments uh, around the state, one of the big things that we find right away is that there, there really isn't one solution for any district. Uh, there's no one solution because everyone has different kinds of equipment, uh, and all these different uh, heating and cooling systems have different advantages and disadvantages depending on the part of the state that they might be located in, depending on the kind of outdoor environment and indoor environment that they face. And so the goal is to always understand multiple layers of defense. Uh, and so as Dr. Altman mentioned, whether it's smoke and fires, heavy particulates uh, uh, in the Central Valley, or you have uh, lot large challenges with respiratory flus and other viruses, especially in he more heavily populated areas, uh, the breathing zone is the real issue. So as we're doing our assessment work, we've been studying looking for dead zones, looking for stratification, understanding how air is flowing, how, how air is being distributed inside the buildings. And so uh, our goal for all the districts we work with is to help them design an airflow and air distribution strategy and an air filtering and an air monitoring strategy. And of course the mechanical challenges uh, with bringing in as much fresh air as possible. So as we've been uh, traveling the state and working with different districts, you know, we're, we're looking at different parts of the equipment process uh, and, and we see four or five fairly often challenges and or, or problems. We have seen a lot of uh, damaged economizers or damper uh, actuators and failures. We see challenges with fresh air, uh, filter racks misaligned, filter racks not being used. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've talked about as well is equipment that's been commissioned, but it was never set up correctly to meet Title 24 code when installed. Uh, poorly maintained equipment, we have seen that over and over, deferred maintenance. And into all of this, of course, is also the, the fact that the air quality indoor and the air quality outdoor is very much infected by the, uh, impacted, I should say, by the outdoor environment. So close to a freeway or heavy crop dust in the Central Valley, uh, smoke and fires. I mean, we've, we've, we're working with districts who said, look, Rich, we're less concerned about COVID. We're less concerned about, um, you know, uh, a pollen and crop dust. Our problem is smoke and fire. Our number one problem is smoke and fire. So it really does 
um, matter on what, where the school districts are located, what kind of an outdoor environment. Now, last thing I'll say, we have also found districts who've installed other technologies that they've purchased in the uh, part of the pandemic, other uh, air cleaning technologies, and some of that's not been installed necessarily correctly or, or installed the right way. So um, a lot of different challenges for schools and of course the, the difference between deferred maintenance uh, or breakdown maintenance, running equipment till it breaks down, we've been finding that to be a, a big challenge. Dr. Altman will tell us now a little bit about some of the long-term solutions that we're thinking about. Thank you, Richard. Earlier, I spoke about the educational path the SARS-CoV-2 virus has taken us down. We're now seeing new guidance from our national leadership that is well worth reading. Uh, we're presenting the highlights here with a focus on how to achieve healthier indoor air. Uh, first, though, take a look around the room that you are in right now. Do you have an air handling system or do you have hot water, heat, and out outdoor air cooling? If you do have an HVA system, take a moment Look around for where the supply vent and the return duct are in your room. The air movement in your room where you're sitting right now goes from one to the other. Next slide, Richard. The next slide is one of Dr. Corsi's graphs in the upper right showing the typical ceiling supply return room. The filtered air hugs the ceiling much like the smoke testing demonstration in the bottom right. Or if the vents are wall to wall, we have movement like that shown in the lower left classroom. In all these cases, the air in Dr. Corsi's breathing zone is relative dead space. Temperature control is maintained by slow air mixing, but air replacement is not effective in the breathing zone. The ideal is called laminar flow like an airplane or an operating room. The air comes out at the ceiling, returns from the floor. Air current in the room is top down not across. As I exhale, my breath is carried down, not across, so that you don't inhale it. There are many ways to manage non-ideal air distribution systems, mostly by increasing the air flow. If we cycle the air faster, it will naturally capture more of the dead space air. I mentioned three fans here, so turn off the HVA system demand control, Turn the HVC fan on at least an hour before you occupy and run it continuously through the day, rather than having it only run when the thermostat calls for temperature or humidity adjustment. Second, turn on all of the freestanding exhaust fans in bathrooms, kitchens, storerooms. And thirdly, simply put box fans in the dead corners to enhance mixing. As they say, dilution is the solution to pollution and mixing the air will dilute the virus that's in the breathing zone or the contaminant. In terms of cleaning the air, removing contaminated air from the breathing zone is step one. Once we capture the air in the return air duct, we need to filter it. Pushing air through a MERV 13 filter is difficult. Think about how much harder it is to breathe through an N95 mask relative to a simple surgical mask or even a simple surgical mask compared to a cloth mask. Is your HVAC fan powered to push through a MERV 13 filter? If not, installing a high efficiency filter will actually slow down the airflow and reduce turnover rates in the room, counterintuitively making the room less safe, not more safe. In those cases, we may need to add side stream filters such as the one in Dr. Corsi's graphic. But notice that if we place that unit behind you, it will draw my breath to you on its way to that filter, increasing your exposure. So place the unit strategically based on that room's occupancy and air, existing air current. Outdoor air again is terrific if it's clean, but many schools are located in areas of high smog, pollen, or forest fire smoke. In those cases, a pre-filter may be necessary. Now Roger is going to present an interesting real life case study. Uh, thank you, Dr. Altman and Richard. Everybody, my name is Roger Silvera. I am the Director of Facilities, Maintenance, and Operations for Eastside Union High School District out in San Jose, uh, California. We're the largest high school district in Northern California with about uh, 22,000 students. Our approach has been consistent with AB, AB 841. Uh, we took some early guidance uh, from UC Davis. Uh, we work closely with them uh, quite often. And, and the three uh, prioritized recommendations were 
testing uh, of existing ventilation systems, installing MERV 13 filter uh, where possible, and then uh, monitoring. Uh, we currently monitor uh, CO2 levels in about 2,000 classrooms on a daily basis. Next slide. Uh, so, you know, at Eastside, I, we were doing this work uh, well before COVID-19. We were actually featured on NBC News uh, back in 2019 for the ventilation and monitoring work we were doing uh, back then. We, we were learning early, early then that ventilation uh, was key to, to indoor air quality, uh, to providing uh, relief from other issues, uh, from VOCs to uh, CO2, CO2 levels, and also mitigating uh, influenza. We, we had learned early on that uh, one of the good ways to deal with uh, influenza in schools was to, to provide better ventilation. And so we started working actually in early 2018 when we started doing this work. Next slide. As we returned uh, from summer break and schools opened fully, we noticed uh, that our, our, our positive case rates were, were significantly uh, lower than, than most other schools. Our, our positive rate was less than 1% for the, for the first month of school. And we held that rate uh, pretty much through the holiday break. And, and when school reopened after the holiday break, uh, there, there were, Omnicom hit, hit schools pretty hard. And there are quite a few schools that had closed. Um, and, and a lot of schools throughout the country and even, even in Seneca were closed due to the high rates. Um, Omnicom hit, hit us pretty hard, but we still managed to uh, stay open. Our, our rate was roughly about 7%, uh, which was significantly lower than most other schools. And we were able to keep all schools open and students in classroom as safe as possible with, with, with fairly low rates compared to uh, other schools. And so uh, today, our, our current rate is, is still uh, holding up pretty well. We're, we're actually doing better today than we were back in August. Our current rate is as a quarter of 1%. And we've, been, we've been managed to keep schools open and safe uh, with the process uh, that we, we've been working with. And I'll lay it out in, in, in guidance, uh, uh, in current guidance with AB841 and, and with guidance from uh, UC Davis. Thank you, Roger. Uh, so we just wanted to take a minute or two here to talk a little bit more about the AB841 ventilation and plumbing grants, actually, but we'll be focused on ventilation and safer air grants first. And what have we uh, learned in helping districts apply for the grants, uh, be accepted, and then begin to uh, execute on the grants? And so, as, as Dr. Altman said earlier, uh, districts that are not uh, with as many resources as some of the very large super districts around the state really do uh, are looking for a partner to help them navigate the different challenges with indoor ventilation, with safer air, understanding now that as masks come off, we need a different a longer term strategy. And so to take advantage of the $650 million that the AB 841 program, the money is provided by the utility companies, the grants are given to each school district, and majority of the money has so far gone to the priority underserved, actually all the money, there'll be a change in 60 more days that we don't know quite yet, but all the money so far has been awarded to priority underserved areas. However, we found there's a number of districts that have passed. Uh, people thought uh, it was too complicated. They thought that we didn't have the staff to administer something. They were concerned that there would be records and audits. None of that, uh, as we got deeper into this, was the case. Uh, there, there are no ongoing audits. However, uh, many districts were very busy with Omicron in January, very busy with uh, vacation schedules in, in December. So there was a number of uh, districts who missed the cutoff of round one on January 31st. Uh, the good reality to this, and what's nice about it, is it only takes 15 minutes to really build out an estimate and understand if it's a worthwhile endeavor and what are some of the uh, goals and objectives for the school district and how do those match with the goals and objectives for the AB 841 program. So a simple 15-minute process will allow us to come up with an estimate, and it, it's very simple to upload one after that. So I think people did misunderstand how easy it was uh, and... Uh, and, and what you do with your school sites in a district that, uh, that are qualified for the awards, for the priority underserved awards, does not impact your other districts, the other schools in your district that might not qualify. 
in the underserved capacity. So there's there's been again a, a bit of misinformation, and as you go through a pandemic, these are all part of a normal communication process. The main goal is for people to get the assessments done, to understand the current state of their systems, to understand what immediate repair work can be done uh, at no cost because they do provide contingency funds to help with adjustments, to help repair coils and, and repair demand ventilation and evaporator and other equipment, economizer equipment that is broken, uh, bathroom exhaust fans as well. And all of this work can be done with no direct pressure uh, on school budgets, on school general funds, uh, and typically school boards are happy to see that. And I think in the end on all of this, we've, we've really found that superintendents, chief business officers, um, maintenance operations folks, uh, and your, your learning leaders within a district are really focused on safety. They're focused on a, delivering a competitive education. And of course, they're trying to do is, is they're very best with taxpayer funds. And I think that is a big part of, of what we're trying to, to drive for. And it's not just about saving money because we're repairing equipment or saving money with energy. We know that the quality of the air in a building has a direct impact on absenteeism. It has a direct impact on student behavior. It has a direct impact on student achievement as well as teacher retention. And I think the one of the stats uh, two stats that, that, that I'll mention here uh, before we go to our Q&A panel. One of them was we had a, uh, in Humboldt County, a teacher retired just recently, and he said, now that I've retired and I'm not indoor, inside one of our buildings, I can breathe again finally. And so his asthma and other uh, breathing difficulties all cleared up when he stopped teaching and being inside a, a school district building. And then the second thing I would say is that we know from studies in Chicago and in Washington, D.C., one of the number one reasons, if not the number one reason, teachers leave their job is that my health is poor, my breathing is not good, and this is not a good environment for me to work in. So we know that these are some of the uh, big challenges that we face, and we're very excited to be working with the California School Board Association, uh, any of the public health agencies we've been involved with in many of the counties around the state, and, of course, the leadership uh, of these different school districts that we're working with. So we'll transition now to the question and answer session. We've had about 16 questions that we've collected uh, over the last six months. Another set of questions that came in was regarding uh, what can I do before I'm taking action? What can I do before an assessment? What can I do before I might change out equipment? And how can I improve the, uh, the air or the flow of air and distribution of air while I'm waiting uh, for an assessment or other information? Dr. Altman, did you want to grab that one? Sure. Uh, the CDC actually has a nice document called uh, Tools in the Mitigation Toolbox that talks about things that can be done immediately to improve the air. The system is operating properly. So whatever equipment you have right now, you wanna make sure that it's working as it was designed to work. Second one is to rebalance your HVAC system to increase total airflow. The third one is to turn off the demand control ventilation, the DVC, so that you have continuous air turnover uh, and the fans are running uh, at continuously. Um, the third next one is to improve the central air filtration using as high a, a uh, filter, high a, a MERV rating filter as you can uh, that the fan that's, uh, that you have in your system will tolerate. Next one is to increase the introduction of outdoor air. We found many of the schools have actually closed their outdoor air dampers. Uh, if you are in a safe outdoor air environment, uh, inc opening them to allow about 20% outdoor air mixture uh, is ideal. Uh, if you have to put in a pre-filter, you want to keep that in mind. If you're near forest fires, uh, pollution, uh, uh, pollen, you may need to pre-filter the air. Uh, if you are able to reposition your supply and exhaust louvers uh, and air grills uh, or the damper settings to create directional or laminar airflow, uh, you want. if you aren't able to do that, then put some fans in the corners, the, the dead zones, to create turb air turbulence or air turnover. Uh, ensure that your restroom exhaust fans are working and operating at their full capacity and keep them on uh, during the, the time that the building is occupied. Uh, and lastly, inspect and maintain the exhaust ventilation systems in your kitchens 
uh, or store rooms and operate them even when the room is not occupied. Thank you, Dr. Altman. How about the second one here on putting portable filters or fans uh, with placement? We talked about, touched on that briefly in the uh, presentation. Yes, so uh, portable filters work. Uh, the, the famous Corsi box where you tape uh, some HEPA filters together uh, in making a, a square and then tape them to a cheap um, uh, box stand that you can get at Home Depot for $20 actually does work. Uh, and those are very inexpensive. The key to the portable filters is where you place them so that uh, if you look at where the supply duct and the return ducts are, you want to be placing your portable filters in the, uh, the dead zones that are away from the normal air movement or the natural air movement and circuits that you have uh, from the air handling system. One of the first questions that we wanted to tackle today, and this is something that we get quite a bit about energy efficiency, and a lot of folks are getting involved with planning for construction projects or replacement, but one of the questions, how can I use the outcome of an AB 841 assessment to enhance or add to my facility master plan? Roger, did you want to take that one first? Yeah, so um, within, a, within a facilities master plan, um, they typically have a complete assessment of all your HVAC equipment. And, and it's pretty costly to hire an engineering firm just to gather that data. And with the ABA 41, um, it's, it's actually free. You get that included, that uh, very detailed assessment of all of your equipment uh, and its current condition uh, that you can pop right into your uh, master plan, your physician master plan. If you're developing one or you have an existing one, you can just pop that data right into it. Uh, at, at no cost. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Roger. Also, a closely aligned follow-up then is the second question on this slide. Will the assessment help me with my energy efficiency needs and energy efficiency planning? Roger? Yeah, so um, the assessments that are laid out in AB 841 are very similar uh, and almost uh, identical to what the utilities call a uh, retro commissioning. And so if you, if you take any existing equipment or new equipment, and you uh, assess it and, and, and make sure it is functioning and operating and tuned uh, to, to, to design criteria, uh, you, you'll save energy. Uh, what happens over time, these things fall out of adjustment or they were never adjusted correctly to begin with. So once you go through the work of assessing them and getting them up to design standards, you'll typically save energy in the process. Thanks again, Roger. Another uh, set of questions that came in had to do with, what about if I have to replace uh, a lot of equipment. Will I have to replace things when you find uh, my equipment is old? And the follow-up to that is we had a CBO recently ask, and it's happened on more than one occasion, what about our bargaining units finding out that uh, we've had an assessment done and there's, there's issues with our equipment? And I think there's a couple of answers to this. Number one, the California Energy Commission and the AB 841 folks uh, and the folks um, at the California School Board Association as well are very much wanting to have a good idea of how much infrastructure needs do school districts really have around the state and the different counties. And so if, we, if we're not upfront with how much uh, deferred maintenance we have, and if we don't know how many repairs we need and how old our infrastructure is, then it's hard for us to go to the politicians and other folks uh, and the powers that be and ask for certain numbers uh, of different levels of funding, whether it's tied to a pandemic or not. So it's very important for the um, AB 841 process to get a very, very clear understanding of what are the infrastructure needs for California schools. The second part to this is about outsiders finding out, you know, I don't, I think the, 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 the big thing here is that we don't need to be ashamed if we're getting free money that the, uh, the Energy Commission is providing to us. And I think in some regards, hooray for us, if we're doing something about deferred maintenance, if we're taking state money and fixing some of our, um, infrastructure that has been uh, in disrepair or infrastructure that's old and we're trying to build better systems and we're making sure that the air is safer for our students, for our support staff, for our faculty and visitors and parents. And we don't need to be ashamed about that. And I think when there's decades and decades of deferred maintenance, it takes a while to get all of that equipment fixed. So I think we're taking advantage of state funds. We're fixing our problems right now. And we're very, very glad that the state has put this money available for us. And we're very glad that we have someone who can help us. So I think um, 
it's important to understand that we can't get it all fixed overnight. And this is a first step, but we should be very, very uh, glad that we uh, didn't uh, pass this, this money by and these opportunities. Next question here, uh, Roger, I want you to start with this one. Is CO2 monitoring alone sufficient to ensure safer air? And what kind of monitoring and or monitors or systems can be put in place? And so, you know, we use them at Eastside. I have over 2,000 of them throughout our district. Uh, no, they're not the um, um, only tool. They're, they're, you know, something in your tool belt that you, you want to have. Um, they are a great indicator of poor ventilation. Um, and, and, and so um, the more CO2 you have in the room, the more uh, breaths there are floating in the space. And so it's a good indicator you have a, a problem uh, that you, you may need to address. Um, but it's not, you know, the, the only tool to ensure you have safe air. It's one of the tools uh, that, that's a good indicator you have a problem. How about what kinds of monitors can be put in place, Roger? Um, and so, you know, ABA 41 has a very specific uh, guidance on what type. Um, if, if, you, if you apply for the grant, uh, it covers the install, they covers the, the product and the installation. Um, and it should be typically installed at a certain elevation in the room, uh, away from doors and windows, uh, so, so you get better data. Um, and this should typically be plugged in um, according to the, the guidance from, from, from um, the, the ABA 41. And we have another uh, question that came in wanting to know what kind of repairs will the AB841 contingency funds allow? Uh, and will, will they allow me to buy some portable uh, filtration devices? Will allow me to buy a new package unit or a new barred unit in a portable trailer? And so um, I think it's, and it's a very common question that we get. And the, the answer is, the 20% contingency funds that each school receives as part of their assessment budget is for repairs only, repairing broken coils, repairing economizers, evaporators, repairing broken bathroom exhaust fans, as Dr. Altman has mentioned, important to have everything in good working order. So the 20% and will allow for some additional adjustments of equipment that you have. Uh, and of course, the idea here being as we've documented uh, any of the deficiencies in the system, and now anything that is inoperable can be repaired using the contingency funds. Another question that we get often is, or a statement people say, hey, I just got brand new equipment. Isn't this a waste of my time? I just put in new HVAC systems, new package units last year. I put in new package units two years ago. We had a fire and we built a brand new school and it's only a year and a half old. Well, part of the answer to this is UC Davis has done a number of studies. And Roger, would you take this one, please? Yeah, so uh, there's a recent study out of UC Davis uh, showed that schools that had new equipment installed, 80% of those, those classrooms, that equipment wasn't, in, wasn't commissioned or adjusted to meet you know, Title 22 requirement. So even though it's new, it wasn't adjusted correctly uh, to meet the ventilation requirements. Um, it, it, it's not going to produce the air quality you're looking for. And also uh, equipment fails. Uh, I, I've seen new equipment fail in six months and a year. So the equipment does fail. Those economizers, the actuator, those things do fail that provide the fresh air. So, um, you know, it, it's good to go back every year and take a look at what you have, uh, not just one time. Thank you again, Roger. Uh, Last set of questions here. Uh, one of the questions that comes up oftentimes is, have there been any studies on school discipline or student behavior as it relates to air quality, similar to the teacher uh, fatigue or teacher health? Uh, this is more focused on the student. And I know, Roger, you've done some uh, studies on this or some, some informal studies. Uh, could you uh, comment, please? Yeah, so I haven't seen research coming out of, out of universities on it, but um, we, we internally, we do track disciplinary data at Eastside, and when I compare the, um, the disciplinary rates, um, you know, they, they create a bell, a bell curve with peak times right around noon, and when I overlay all of our uh, CO2 levels and poor ventilation uh, levels over those disciplinary charts, they overlap and, and it pretty much peak at the exact same time. So we're, we're noticing that disciplinary rates peak at the same time poor air quality peaks in classrooms. And if you look at the data coming on the symptoms from poor air quality, it's pretty consistent with fatigue, irritability, 
uh, brain fog, the different different symptoms created by poor air quality that will contribute to poor, poor decision making in classrooms. Thank you, Roger. Uh, that's all the questions that we had today. Certainly, uh, we can accept others by email. Uh, our contact information will be connected, obviously, to the uh, recording as it goes out. But James, did you want to do a wrap up for us today? Thank you, Richard. Uh, a lot of great information today that will hopefully help our school district success and make strategic decisions with uh, AB 841 and other areas of concern involving safe air. Thank you to our partner LifeWings, Peak Performance, and thank you to our CSBA members for taking the time to review today's webinar as well. Lastly, C CSBA is dedicated to providing up-to-date resources to our school board members. To view our recent webinars, be sure to check out our YouTube page at youtube.com slash CSBA video. If you are interested in attending future CSBA webinars, please go to our website at www.csba.org slash webinars to register for upcoming uh, webinars as well. Again, many thanks to our presenters. Uh, thank you for taking the time today. Um, and with that, we'll see you next time. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us for this session. We do have a few questions that came in. I'm Good morning. Going... My name is James Collins, Sr. Sorry American about that. Business of... I'm going to pass those questions along to the appropriate people. We'll get you an answer as soon as possible within one business day. We will be sending out a email to everyone who registered, whether you were able to attend today or not, with the recording, uh, a video of the recording, so you can have that for your, for your sources. We'll include uh, email, contact information, for CSBA and for LifeLinks. So with that, we will end here. I wanna thank you again and have a great afternoon.